this morning, I thought it would be fun to come and talk to you about some of the work that's been going on in my group here at uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I'm a research oceanographer in the Marine Physical Lab, uh, having to deal with uh, active sounds and passive sounds. And then I also want to tell you a little bit about what some of my colleagues are doing here uh, at Scripps. And so we're going to talk a little bit about me, a fair amount about other people as well. Okay, so outline of the talk. Um, a few years ago, I instituted a uh, course here in bioacoustics at the uh, Oceanographic Institution, and I thought that my talk could, in fact, follow the um, structure of my bioacoustics talk, and that is uh, why sound, a little bit on the introduction to the physics of sound, uh, active sonar systems. We're going to talk about uh, work that's going on in my group. Uh, we invented a system called Fish TV. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some upper ocean physics. That's uh, other co-workers of mine in the marine physical lab. A little bit about the acoustic tomography project going on here. And then we're going to talk about passive sonar systems. So the first concept that I want to present to you is the difference between an active sonar system and a passive sonar system. So right now, you folks are listening to me and you are a passive sonar system. Whether you know it or not, you're actually a passive sonar system <laughs> and because you're listening to me. And because I'm talking to you, I am an active sonar system, okay? And so we do both of those things in oceanography. You may have been on a fishing boat and uh, you've seen some of the nice color images that they get of the fish. And so in that case, you would be doing what we call pinging. And you, when you're pinging, you're an active sonar system. And when you're simply listening, you're a passive sonar system. So we do both of those things here. So in terms of passive sonar systems, we also have groups that look at ambient sound, say, in the surf zone. That's Grant Dean, another one of my colleagues. Mike Buckingham, a uh, professor here in the department, proposed a very interesting idea many years ago called acoustic daylight. And then uh, finally, I will be playing some uh, recordings of uh, cetaceans uh, some of us find them to be the most fascinating animals in the sea. We have a group here, uh, John Hildebrand, who's also a professor in the department and a member of the Marine Physical Lab, has been working with blue whales for a while. So, whew, I'm almost out of breath just talking about what I'm going to be talking about. But let's talk about the physics of sound. Now, um, one thing that I did also want to uh, tell you about is the motivation for sound. Now, for instance, you'd ask yourself the question, why would an animal develop the capability of using sound? Why wouldn't it use optics or light? And the answer is actually uh, fairly simple. There's one good reason, because light doesn't travel very far in the sea. But sound, in fact, does. And so if you're sitting on one coast and you want to talk to your friend who's sitting on the other coast, uh, you don't have the opportunity that we have <laughs> as a blue whale, so you have to vocalize. And it's an amazing fact that, in fact, blue whale vocalizations can be heard transoceanically. And they actually vocalize at very, very low frequencies. And it turns out the higher the frequency, the uh, less far the sound travels. The lower the frequency, the farther the sound travels. So in order to be he heard across an ocean, a blue whale has to speak at a very, very, with a very, very low voice. So here are some numbers here. Uh, sound loses about two-thirds of its energy in about 30 kilometers, or let's say something like 18 miles. That's at one kilohertz, uh, which is a reasonable frequency for, for us to hear. Whereas light loses two-thirds of its energy, something like 60 meters. So you can see right away, there's a huge difference between the propagation of light and the propagation of sound. <laughs> Speed of sound actually is pretty slow. Certainly when you compare it to light, it only goes about 1,500 meters per second, whereas light goes 300 million meters per second. It's three times 10 to the eighth. We're all into scientific notation. <laughs> so that's 300 million meters per second. And, and an interesting feature of these two, this disparity was the first time people actually measured sound was by uh, they would light a candle or flash a, a, a candle that was lit and the sound would go off at the same time. And then guy would be sitting on the other boat and he'd hit a, hit a, a, a notch on some timer mechanism 
uh, when he saw the light, and then another thing would fire off when they heard the sound. And then you could, the first measurements of the speed of sound were actually made by using the disparity. But of course, uh, the, in, now we know, of course, that light travels at a finite speed, but, but quite fast. Okay, so uh, sound goes a long way, light doesn't go so far, sound is fairly slow, light is fairly fast. Let's get into some of the active studies. What I want to tell you about first is a system that I invented called Fish TV, uh, who's, and, and we're going to go in frequency now. So we ordinarily think of tone, so low tones, high tones, and we're going to start with a fairly high frequency system called Fish TV that I invented for looking at some of the smaller animals in the sea called the euphausids. Go to a medium frequency system that my colleagues here, Rob Pinkle and Jerry Smith, have used for looking at currents. But interestingly enough, sometimes when you divine, um, design an instrument and you use it to look at something, actually you see other things that are interesting to other people as well. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then lastly, for the active systems, we're going to talk about acoustic thermometry, which was a bit of a controversy here at Scripps, if some of you remember. And Peter Wooster has been working with Walter Monk, one of our very distinguished oceanographers here, and perhaps the, the preeminent oceanographer today in the world uh, as well. So, Fish TV. Okay, well, when I got into this business, I had kind of come from the medical imaging world. I had been working as an electron microscopist and doing three-dimensional imaging, and much of the theory that we use for that three-dimensional imagery and imaging was similar to what people used for computerized tomography or CAT scans. And one of the great sort of engineering achievements of the 70s in medical imaging was the evolution of computerized tomography. In fact, the Nobel Prize, perhaps the only time it was awarded to an engineer, was for the invention of computerized tomography. We have medical, we have magnetic research, uh, resonance imaging as well. And so I thought that it would be kind of fun to go and work in the ocean as a sailor in Berkeley when I had, Jeff didn't mention that I had a sailboat in Berkeley, which was almost as important as, as my graduate studies. And I thought, wow, this would be kind of cool to combine my love of imaging with my love of the ocean. And that's sort of how I got involved in this business. It never occurred to me, in fact. So I thought, well, let's, divide, let's design some three-dimensional imaging instruments, and we'll make them collect lots of information, and we'll make them run moderately fast, and for sure, somebody's going to learn something new from them. It was just this kind of thinking, like engineering thinking, like invent the widget. And along came, of course, uh, several oceanographers, biologists, who said, wow, I could use a thing like that. And we started collecting data and started collaborating, and lo and behold, we actually learned something new about the ocean. Now, one of the advantages of building something that's small, of course, is you can do it in the lab. So I thought instead of inventing a thing that was maybe three meters across, we could bu build something small and test it in the lab and, and then work with it. And as I got more and more into this business, I found out that the marine biologists, or biological oceanographers, as we've call, we call them here at Scripps, had, in fact, very few measurements of animal behavior. Then, in fact, if you were a land biologist, Maybe you'd go sit up in a tree with a pair of binoculars and you'd be able to see the animals running around. But if you're a oceanographer or biological oceanographer, the observation of animal behavior in the sea had been pretty difficult because of a lack of tools. So it quickly became apparent to me that in fact this instrument, Fish TV, which did three-dimensional imaging on a small scale, could be used for measuring the behavior of euphausids, which are a kind of zooplankton. And if you don't know, um, zooplankton are the most numerous animals in the ocean. And here's the traditional way that oceanographers have looked at zooplankton. We simply take a net and we tow it along and we scoop up everything that's there, maybe things we're not even interested in, and uh, we get it back on the ship and we count and we know how big our net was and we know how fast we towed it so we can measure the, quote, abundance of those animals. That is the number of animals per cubic meter or per volume. The idea here is that you create a sound system that bounces sound energy off the animals. And moreover, you can do that in three dimensions. And you can measure the individual positions in three dimensions of all of these animals. And you get all this information back on the ship. And what you can measure now is not just the abundance of these animals, 
but you can and also but you can measure their three dimensional spatial spatial distribution but you can also measure their behavior so here we are again going beneath the sea showing you a net toe scooping up the organisms in a moment we're going to come along with the next generation which are three dimensional sonars so that's what's whole here scripts and uh, <laughs> Here we have this three-dimensional imaging system, and we're bouncing sound off of the animals, getting their three-dimensional position, and also measuring their behavior. So that's the deal. Okay, so here's the, the, uh, the ticket. This is Fish TV. It's about this big, so maybe about a foot by nine inches. And uh, these sort of strange-looking things that are kind of yellowish that you're wondering, what the heck are those? Those are ceramic tiles which generate very, very high frequency sound. And it's, it's, the sound is at 435 kilohertz. And our highest frequency that we can hear is around 20 kilohertz. So this is about a factor of 20 higher than we could hear. And to our knowledge, there are no adverse environmental effects on the animals of a system like this. It forms a crude image. It's an 8 by 8 image by 500 um, imaging units long and it, it volumes it images a volume about maybe from here to that post about this big and uh, first thing we did was we put it on an uh, underwater uh, vehicle here you see this is a, a phantom four and it's on a tether and we put it off the side of the ship and we put it down and uh, we had built it we were all proud of ourselves and we saw absolutely nothing with this thing <laughs> so um, we finally figured out what the heck's going on here. Well, it turned out that these animals, these little guys, you know, they get scared of big guys and big orange guys with propellers, you know, I mean, really scare them, you know. I mean, can you imagine sitting in your house and all of a sudden this big orange thing starts coming out of the sky at you with propellers? So we actually went to a, a more passive system for uh, looking at these animals. And we decided we would put, this in, put it in the water on a, on a uh, tether. We would anchor the boat. And we would put a fin on it so that we would be looking into the current. And that the animals would be, we call advection in oceanography. It's a big word to me, just transported via the currents towards us. So we're downstream. Okay? So, so if you're a good hunter, and we're a kind of hunter, we're a uh, sonic predator, let's say, here. Uh, you want to be downstream of your prey so they don't detect your presence. And so we, we finally got that going and we got some neat pictures. So um, what we did was we put it in the ocean and we saw blobs on the screen. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you know, now five years into this research program, we spent probably a million dollars worth of National Science Foundation's money and we had all these glorified ideas about what we were going to do, of course, in order to convince the sponsor. And then we see these blobs. And we were sort of like, what are these blobs? We don't know what they are. You know? So I figure, well, we better invent something to figure out what the blobs are. Okay. So we invented a system called OASIS. And what it is, it's a combination of optical imaging and acoustic imaging. And the idea is that when an animal swims into a predetermined three-dimensional location, we would fire off a strobe light. The strobe light's up in the top. You see that little black canister there. And then we would take a picture of it with a very sensitive camera. These are now scientific grade CCD cameras. And so the animal, it's, it, it would be like uh, walking into a booth and then something would detect your presence and take your picture, basically. So we would have a corresponding sonic reflection from the animal and also an optical image of it at the same time. And it turns out that nobody had ever done this before. People, for the most part, were dredging these animals up, as we had seen, putting them on ship, putting them in tanks, uh, capturing them from the sea. And uh, my, one of my sort of important aspects of my work is that I demand that we do these things in situ. So for instance, you can't hope that you're going to measure an animal at 300 feet depth, pull it out of the ocean, stick it in a tank, measure something about it, and then tell everybody, this is the thing I'm seeing at 300 feet. I mean, it may or may not be. More rigorously, it's correct to do it in situ. And so this device 
was invented. You see, there's, you, might, you can't see it very well. Those yellow things are actually current meters, and we had a few other things on it. So we go up to uh, British Columbia with this. Of course, we always like to pick nice places to work. <laughs> so if you've ever been up to the Bouchard Gardens uh, in Victoria, there's a beautiful fjord there, actually. And it was tough. Somebody had to do it. So we chose ourselves. And uh, we sat there for two weeks. And we brought this device, Oasis, which was optical and acoustic imaging. And it was curious, because uh, when we got out there, uh, we had a crew of ship and all my guys and all these instruments. And it became clear that uh, I was perhaps the only person on board that actually believed that this would work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I guess I was starting to feel a little bit insecure about the situation. And I thought, come on guys, this is easier than putting a man on the moon, you know? Come on, this is, you know, oceanography. And uh, much to everyone's surprise, perhaps mine as well, it, in fact, it did work. <laughs> so let me show you some of the pictures that we got. On the lower right is a lab picture of Euphazid. Okay, now to a whale, that's good eating. There's lots of these animals in the sea. The other three that look kind of fuzzy and a little bit grainy are pictures that we got at a distance of around seven feet. And they were simultaneously taken with optics and triggered by the acoustics, okay? And this is the first time anybody had actually ever done in situ validation of acoustics. So what we did was we could measure the length of the animals. We could know exactly what we were looking at. Now a blob actually turned out to be a thing that we could identify. And we could actually also look at its orientation because you might imagine that the amount of reflected energy is a function of the animal's orientation. For instance, side animal would reflect a lot more sound than an animal that was looking at us head on. So here's a couple of euphazids. And then one morning, uh, I'd woken up at about five in the morning, because when you're out at sea, it turns out you're spending a lot of money, and you've, the incredible amount of preparation that you've done through the year is now all concentrated in this one or two week period. So I tend to be aroused at a certain point in walking around the ship. And then I walked, at five o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I walked into the lab, and we had left the thing running overnight. And we also noticed this guy on the lower right was looking at me, somewhat surprised. And these were also some herring and walleye pollock. And there was a third species there, another kind of zooplankton. And by and large, what we were able to do, and this is pretty much the only graph I'm going to show you, along the horizontal axis is the actual length of the animals here in millimeters. And the vertical axis is something we relate to reflectivity. So higher up means more energy coming back. And as you see here, we could characterize the length of the animals, the species that we were looking at, and the amount of sound that we've got reflected from them. And that's pretty much the first time anybody had ever done this kind of in situ acoustic um, reflection from known species, orientation, and size, which is valuable information. Now here's another way that people have gotten information from the ocean. These are aptly called bongo net toes, and they're done because they're hydrodynamically balanced, and they've found that these are moderately non-invasive. But I want to show you this part here, which is you're now in a swarm of small animals. These are probably a kind of zooplankton, probably not euphazids. And here's a euphazid itself, just to show you a little bit about the animal. Uh, so it's hard to believe, but to a whale, blue whale, uh, that's good eating. And so what we did was we got all this data. We came back with, I don't know, 20 gigabytes of tapes, but it was very successful. And then we processed it, and we were able to get trajectories of the animals. So here, this, is, uh, this shows the three-dimensional volume of our system here. So you see it's a cone. We project sort of a, this rough cone out. And I just wanted to show you, these are now um, exact three-dimensional positions as a function of time. And w using this kind of technology, we could actually measure lots of things. Instead of scooping them up with the net and just seeing how many are there, we can see how far away they are from each other. We can see what their patchiness is in three dimensions. And we can measure their behavior now for, I believe, the first time. We're actually the first people to measure the behavior of these animals. So here's the bacon. Now, I didn't want to just wow you with all this technology. 
because ultimately uh, I'm judged on my ability to contribute to science. So here are some neat things that we learned about the animals. First of all, these animals migrate. During the daytime, they go down to depths. And we think they do that because they're afraid of being eaten, which is good for them because otherwise they'd be gone. And it's an amazing thing about them. They actually migrate something like 30,000, I think I figured out if you and I were migrating this much every day, it would be something like 30 to 50 miles. It's an amazing thing. Of course, they're swimming a couple of body lengths a second. I don't think I could run a couple of body lengths a second. So they're actually able to do that in something like a half an hour or so. We found out during the day, when they're at depth, they pretty much shut their metabolism down. And that was something that people had conjectured, but nobody had actually measured it. The other thing we found, a really interesting effect, was that we were looking at our data, and when I looked at the migration patterns of the animals, I found actually that the smaller animals were migrating up to the surface at an earlier time. Now, it's, imagine now we're at dusk, and the sun is going down, and we're not eat, drinking margaritas, we're sitting in the lab trying to get data. <laughs> and uh, what we see is this incredible migration of animals coming up. And what we noticed in our data was that smaller animals came up a bit earlier than the larger animals. And I called, quickly called my friend here, Mark Oman, who's a well-known zooplankton ecologist, and I said, this is weird. Why are the little guys coming up first? And because the big guys can swim faster, presumably. So I figured, wow, they'd be up first. And this is the first time I'd ever heard an ecologist make a prediction that I could validate. And he said, no, I would expect the smaller animals to come up first because they are less discernible. That is, we call something predation pressure. So the chance of a little guy being eaten is a function of his or her visibility. That is how visible they are to a predator. Little animals, being smaller, are less visible. So therefore, they have the luxury of coming up earlier than the bigger guys. And so this was actually a validation of this hypothesis that animals go to depths during the day so that they won't be eaten, which was very interesting to us. And we published it this year in a well-known oceanographic um, uh, journal. And then finally, uh, one of our students, Alex D. Robertis, of course, one of the great things of being at Scripps is we have really wonderful students. And Alex is one of the best. And he figured out that looking at the inter-animal distances, that the animals don't seem to be schooling. And this was an interesting fact. So these are three interesting things that we've learned about the ecology of these animals. Now the second thing we noticed when we went out on our first cruise was not only that we saw blobs and we didn't know what they are, but we're sitting on this ship, okay, and the ship's bobbing up and down and we've got the sonar and we're perhaps pulling it along. But the animals that are in the sea are, they can swim to a certain extent, but they're also a subject to the currents, we notice that these are two different frames of reference. The ship frame of reference and the being in the sea frame of reference. And so I thought, well, what I want to be is in the, for my instruments that is, in the same frame of reference as the animals. And so we built a new system now, this is the free fall system here, in which this is going to be totally untethered. So we go out, I take a deep breath, the thing gets launched off the back of the boat, I hope we see it again. And it goes down, it's got batteries as you can see, it's got cameras that'll have a sonar on it, and it's going to do pretty much the same stuff. But now instead of doing it in a fjord, we're going to do it out in the deep blue sea. And with this kind of system, we're not only going to, uh, we're going to learn uh, many of the things that we did before, but now since we're in their frame of reference, we're hoping to get longer trajectories of the animals because before they were being swept past us with the current. So their motion is superimposed on the current motion. And so this kind of drifting system is something that we're going to be testing actually in the next month or so. And so it's a pretty exciting development in our lab from my point of view. Okay. The other thing that I wanted to push here was uh, present, I should say, is uh, this new idea of having an exhibit on these zooplankton. And over the past year, I've had the pleasure of working with the person that just found me through the internet. I got an email from this woman, Celeste Fowler, and she said, you know, I'm working for this company called Silicon Graphics up in Silicon Valley, 
and I love to dive, and I want to do three-dimensional graphics, and I want to do it for marine biology. Do you have any ideas? Well, of course I had plenty of ideas. And moreover, she said, I'm willing to volunteer in your group. So I brought her down here, and I said, you know, it would be really wonderful. I mean, so many of the kids' games now, you know, aliens from the planet X or whatever, these animals that we have in the sea are really incredibly fascinating. And unfortunately, most people aren't aware of them, and partly that's a question of scale. So for example, we all love fish, and we all love the large cetaceans, but we know very little about the smallest animals in the sea called the zooplankton. And it turns out that they are actually extremely fascinating animals. And so Celeste, I proposed to her that she work up a three-dimensional animation of a very small animal, three millimeters now. So that's, you know, an, an, an inch is 25 millimeters. So this is now a three mil, it's an eighth of an inch long. And this little, the female, of course, is the voracious raptor. Oh, no, no offense, women, but. Uh, and what it does is it pulls its prey apart, throws away the body, and eats the legs. And so that's, I guess, where the higher food value is. And this is a Yukita. So Celeste spent a, a good deal of time, three or four months, actually working on this animation of a Yukita, which you can see here. And it's a really cool animal. I mean, these, these red things on the front are actually a kind of, uh, not a fang, but a kind, a kind of, they're, they're actually the, the parts that rip the animals apart. And so here you can see some, they have a very simple eye, antenna, for, they can sense extremely small uh, vibrations because when they do sense them, then they, it, it precipitates an escape response from a predator. So here you have a wonderful design of a very small animal that uh, people have no idea about. And so what I've been promoting here with Jeff and the aquarium is to do an exhibit on these animals. And we decided we're gonna start with a large mechanical, one of these, maybe a 10-foot Yukita with these. <laughs> So we're looking forward to that. I think we're scheduled in 2004 or something like that for that one. Okay, now let's get to the altruistic part of the talk here. Uh, talk about what my colleagues are doing. Now this is a color picture, as you can see. And it turns out if you take a sonar and you build a very fancy one, and Rob Pinkle and Jerry Smith have been doing this for years and they do wonderful sonars. And you take a speaker that's about this big, it's about the size of a large coffee table, and you project sound down. And now, remember, sound goes pretty slow, 1,500 meters per second. So what we can do is we can measure the reflected energy as a function of time. And what we see are layers of animals that reflect energy back to us as a function of their depth, because of course time and depth are the same thing. And if you walk along the ocean, or run along the ocean, or go along the ocean in a ship, as Rob Pinkle did, what you see here time along the horizontal axis, depth along the vertical axis, and if you see our little color scale here, red and light green turn out to be very sonically reflecting areas, and the dark blue and purple tend to be very low sonically reflecting areas. And what you see almost is, are these little greenish yellow spikes with blue areas in between. And what that is are these zooplankton that are in the day, they're at a depth of five to 700 meters. And as dusk descends, you see those little green vertical stripes. Those are the animals coming up in the water column. And you can see they do that over a very short amount of time, maybe about a half an hour, as I told you before. And then they sit on the surface, presumably eating what they do eat. Um, and, then at night, and then as the sun rises, they go back down again. So this is a picture from uh, Rob's work. Rob and Jerry are actually more interested in the currents in the ocean and upper ocean physics. But this is another example of an active sonar system, that is a system that produces sound in order to interrogate the ocean. And here you see, this is a bit lower frequency. This is about 120 kilohertz. Remember, our hearing goes to 20. This is 120. Fish TV was at 450. Okay, so the lowest frequency sounds that people have sent has been part of the acoustic tomography experiment. And my friend here, Pete Worcester, was nice enough to give me some of his data. And here you see a source on Kauai, not a bad place to put a source. 
And the idea of this is just as the same in medical tomography where they send x-rays through people and they can measure the attenuation, here they're actually proposed to measure the speed of sound in the ocean by looking at the changes in the travel time of sound. So sound speed is a function of temperature. It speeds up when the temperature changes and slows down when the temperature changes. So using that increase and decrease in the amount of time it takes to get a sound from Kauai to, let's say, Monterey, where one of the receivers was, they can look at relative changes, and this has to be all extremely precise, because these changes are on the orders of fraction of a millisecond. And so they were able to look at changes in temperature, but I wanted to play you one of the eight talk sounds. So here we go. So what, what uh, Pete Worcester and, and uh, Walter Monk have been working on for a number of years have been measuring these transbasin basin temperature changes by using the changes in the speed of the propagation sound in order to do that. And um, what I will be showing you in, in a moment will be a map of temperature anomalies. So for instance, the traditional problems of oceanographers have been that the ocean is big, and how do you sample something that's so large that's changing in space and changing in time? And getting in the ocean, as we've already learned, with sound is pretty much the only way that we can, um, quote, image it. So these low frequency sounds, in fact, have the capability of traveling across the ocean. I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm still <laughs> waiting for the computer to come up. <laughs> and um, what they do, what they're able to do is look at the temperature anomalies in the sound speed and basically map out changes in the, uh, in the structure of the, and, and so this is the number of experiments. So we might want to just say a little bit about the, the ATOC experiment here, because I know at the beginning, when ATOC uh, first came up, there were some concern about the environmental effects of ATOC, and I thought it could maybe take this interlude to address those, some societal thing here. And um, it turns out, as I said on KPBS radio about a week ago, we had a call in and everybody, every time they get an oceanographer from Scripps, they always want to know, well, what about that experiment where you were basically deafening all the uh, cetaceans in the ocean? It was absolutely the worst press that we had ever had here. And the thing that I think we found most disconcerting about the situation was that, first of all, the people that were criticizing us had made a mistake of a factor of a million, okay? Now, this is particularly, you know, as scientists, what we try to do is, quote, get it right. And that means that we put our papers out in a peer review process where people can judge the assumptions that we make and judge their validity. And I think from a scientific point of view, the most annoying thing about this was that from, just from a basic physics point of view, they were an error by a factor of a million. But nevertheless, uh, I talked to Walter Monk last week about that, and he said, well, I called them up, I won't do my Walter Monk imitation for you, he says, I called them up on the phone and I told them that they were off by a factor of a million. And he said, well, they said, well, we don't care. You're still injuring the hearing of the cetaceans. And, um, you know, so the, the point is that, um, but nevertheless, I think it's incumbent upon us as scientists to look at the environmental effects of these things. And over the last three or four years, a lot of money has been spent at looking at the effects of the sound on the animals, the behavioral studies in conjunction with the sources going on. And from our observational point of view, we see the animals either do nothing or they actually go a different direction. So I think we're sort of clear on that one for now. So here's the thermal map that Pete Worcester and, um, and, and colleagues came up with. You can see here, we mean by blue, we, we mean an area where the sound is actually, where the temperature is actually getting colder. And, and by red, we mean an area where the temperature is actually getting warmer. So here's an example of the extremely low frequency sounds, which you can use to map ocean basins. Okay, let's talk about passive acoustics now. 
I want to introduce you to some of the things that my colleagues in the Marine Physical Lab are doing, uh, Grant Dean, Mike Buckingham, and John Hildebrand. Well, Grant's been interested in looking at uh, surf zone noise for a long time, and it turns out that we don't really understand a lot of the energetics of waves, even though you can go stand out there and look at waves. And so one way of looking at their energetics and understanding uh, the energetics, how much energy they're, they're putting out as a function of time, is to go put out some hydrophones. Here you see, in this area here, there's a diver, and this is an underwater um, hydrophone, that is a microphone that goes underwater. And here's a sort of schematic of the Scripps Pier, which shows you where this thing is. It's 70 meters, uh, the no noise monitoring station, 360 meters west of MLW, wherever that is, and 70 meters south of the pier. So it's just in this area right here. So about half the pier length off. And if you're in the water listening, uh, and a boat goes by, here's what you're going to hear. If I do that again. Here's a boat now. You might want to make it a little lower. Too. Okay, so th the idea of that is not to teach you what a boat sounds like, <laughs> but to kind of give you the, the, um, the perception of that phenomena from the point of view of, of the underwater environment and how invasive it is, in fact. And one of the things I wanted to talk about briefly here was ambient noise, because I think from an environmental point of view, the problem that we're coming up against now in this century is ambient noise and its intrusion into the lives of animals that live underwater and, their, and its, its inhibition of their ability to communicate. And I just wanted to touch on that briefly. And the, and the really saddest thing about that is that there's just about nothing that we can do about it. And so um, here's a croakers. Now you have to listen closely. You hear that crackling noise? It turns out there are these small shrimp that uh, it's like a snap, crackle, and pop kind of thing. And they generate this crackling noise. And it was only this past year that the acousticians, <laughs> not because they're so dumb, but because it's a complicated thing, uh, figured out how, in fact, these shrimp are generating this noise. So there's so many things that we, that we don't know about it. But if you listen closely, you'll hear in the background these croakers, or these bottom fish, that inhabit some of the areas around here. An interesting concept that was put forth uh, about six or seven years ago by one of my colleagues, Mike, Mike Buckingham, who is certainly one of the preeminent acoustic, acoustical oceanographers in the world, was this idea of acoustic daylight. And, and it's really a fascinating idea. The idea is that when you and I are walking around during the day, we can see objects because of the sun. And so um, that's daylight. And so Mike thought, well, maybe in the water, there's a lot of, definitely in the water, there are a lot of um, sounds being made by, for instance, the shrimp that we just heard. And perhaps animals, in fact, and perhaps the Navy, of course, they got very interested in this idea, could use this noise field, this ambient sound field, as a way of imaging things underwater. And so, in fact, Mike was able to get a, a fair amount of money, and they created a large parabolic reflector. And now, remember, we're now not in the, in the active part of the talk, we're in the passive part of the talk, and uh, just listening now. And Mike was able to show, to a certain extent, uh, that in fact you could form some images by taking a large parabolic reflector as a microphone. Now this, think of this as an underwater telescope almost, which is collecting lots of sound and forming it into an image. You could in fact create some images, perhaps a little bit cruder than, than we had hoped, but I just wanted to introduce you to this concept of using acoustic daylight, because I think it's a, a neat idea, even if it doesn't work. And surely one of the things that we need to be doing here 
at the university are thinking of new and exciting ideas and having the, the ability to try them out even if they don't work. And so that's what I really love about the, you know, this environment. So this is the more fun part of the talk here. It turns out, as you well know, that um, marine mammals have evolved very, very sophisticated means for using sound underwater. And what I want to show now, or, or sorry, should I say, uh, allow you to hear, are three examples of that. Terciops now, that's the bottlenose dolphin, everyone's friend Flipper. And uh, even though there's no research going on here at Scripps in bottlenose dolphins, there's actually a wonderful group down in Point Loma on the Nafee base that is researching these bottlenose dolphins, and we've been talking more about doing stuff with them. Um, it turns out that these animals basically have two different modes of generating sounds. One would be a click train, click, 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 and they use that for echolocation. That is, they can judge the distance of objects. And they're amazing. I mean, these animals can tell the difference between a nickel and a penny using sounds. And we have absolutely no understanding of how they do that. And it's just a really fascinating area. The other thing they can do, of course, is communicate. And while we've eavesdropped on them, of course, we don't really understand what's going. But one of my friends, Peter Tyak, who works at Woods Hole, has found, for instance, that mothers and their babies have uh, signatures that are much like each other and more like each other than another animal. So for example, how does a, a mother dolphin find her baby in a pack of these animals? And perhaps it's by doing this signature imitation kind of thing. And even though we must understand that their mechanisms that they use do not transcend the physics principles that we know, we still have no idea of how these animals are doing it. The other sort of interesting thing about terciops is that they are a voracious predator. So for instance, when you see a dolphin, you know, they have that cute little smiley face. You know, you go, oh, it's so nice, a dolphin. These animals are wonderful pack hunters and every bit as scary as uh, some of the raptors from Jurassic Park, as the orca whales are when they get into a situation. And so don't let that little smiley face. Uh, so here's one of them. OK, so that's a sort of typical signature whistle from a, a terciops. And uh, they actually, there's lots to, that we could say about them, and I, I just simply don't have enough time. Take my bioacoustic scores. <laughs> okay, sperm whales. Here's a diver with a sperm whale. That gives you a, uh, an idea of scale. And, uh, you know, I'm glad it wasn't me. <laughs> Although I suspect that we're seeing a projection of those two things. Yeah, right, exactly. Next you see the leg sticking out of the animal's mouth. <laughs> Bye-bye. No, um, and you know, it's interesting, when you look at the morphology of these animals, of course, the thing that strikes you is they have this huge forehead. And, and so, and, and as we all know, the sperm whales were exploited uh, in the last century for spermaceti, which was this waxy material. And this, see, I'm very sort of sonar-centric here, okay? So when I look at a sperm whale, and I look at that huge head, I think to myself, that inside of it is a sonar lens. That's why that animal has, has that huge head. If you look back at Terciops, you look at the, fore, the forehead here now, that is a sonar lens. So these animals are optimized, just as you and I have wonderful eyes, incredibly acute vision, and, and, and they've shown, in fact, that people can see single photons. These animals are optimized for their environment, which is an environment where optics and, and, and light doesn't work, and sound is the way to go. Now, sperm whales use click trains to locate their prey. And so here's, here's an example of a, a click train. You hear that click? Yeah, that click, okay. So that's a sperm whale, and it's, it's locating, presumably, its prey. Now, there, is, there had been some speculation that these animals actually stunned their prey. 
by having huge sound levels. And previous to a few years ago, nobody had ever measured a sound level that was high enough to actually support that hypothesis. But about two years ago, a group in Germany, in fact, because you think, how are you going to study a sperm whale? You know, you can't do it in the swimming pool. <laughs> you got to go out there. And now, if, it's, if it actually generates a high level of sound, that's going to be focused into a small area, right? So you have to be in that small area. And it's not easy to do all of those things. But uh, so they've actually found that sperm whales, we now know they're generating quite high levels of sound. And of course, one of the most elusive prey of the sperm whale is the giant squid, of course. And, and there's a bit of fascination with these animals called Arctuthis. And I had an idea of, I thought it would be, let's go bring one back to the aquarium, you know. Hey, that'd bring a bunch of people in. So I was talking to my friend here, Dick Rosenblatt, who's certainly one of the grand old men of ichthyology around today. And I said, well, let's, he said, how are you going to get this animal? I said, well, they have photophores. And, you know, squid have photophores. And we, maybe we can attract one. He said, well, Jules, giant squid don't have photophores. So. It's back to the drawing board here. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> for a, a sperm whale to stay alive, they probably aren't meeting, eating very many giant squid because as far as we can tell, these animals are not all that abundant. Nevertheless, they can dive to a couple of thousand feet. Now, what is a sperm whale going to eat at a couple of thousand feet? Well, if you remember back to the slide I showed you of Rob Pinkle's work where we had that acoustic color picture, you, you, re, you may remember that at, at five to seven hundred meters, there's lots of animals there. So these animals have certainly adapted to dive on these layers of we call mesopelagic middle of the ocean animals. Okay, so sometimes we go out and we actually record things that uh, we don't even know. For instance, there's this thing called a boink which uh, John Hildebrand has one of his students working on. And we don't know whether the mil of course, we always suspect what the Navy's doing, you know. It's a Navy thing, you know. You, na you know, you can't distinguish between whether it's not or is because they're not going to tell you. Oh, yeah, that's our super secret, you know, blank for finding the Soviet submarines. Um, but we do find things that, that are surprising. So you hear that, sounds like a thunderstorm, right? But it's not, it's from a hydrophone in the water. And as best as we can tell, it's from an underwater earthquake. So this is a kind of rare event. Okay. And last, but not least, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about blue whales. I mean, most of us know a blue whale is the largest animal that's ever existed on the face of the earth. And I, I think it's absolutely a wonderful pleasure to coexist <laughs> with this animal. These animals, as I mentioned before, can actually communicate transoceanic basin. And when the Navy declassified, now we're talking, I think, early 90s, late 80s, their arrays of hydrophones for listening to Soviet submarines, we were actually able to use these to track blue whales. So there's one blue whale called Big Blue or something like that. That they, they got more data, the cetacean biologists got more data in the first month of the Soviet, of the declassification of these hydrophone arrays than they had gotten in ever, 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 ever. So they're actually able now to start to track these animals in the deep ocean. And a blue whale generates sounds, the primary is at 15 hertz. So let's think about that, 15 cycles per second. You and I, if you listen to Thus Sprach Zarathustra, the opening of that, you will notice this, oh, you know, very, very low. That's 30 hertz or 20 hertz. And so a blue whale's fundamental frequency is actually lower than that. So I'm going to play you some blue whale sounds. And remember, you're hearing the harmonic now at 30 hertz. And now, of course, you can't send so much information at that rate. Uh, mostly, we think they're just saying, I'm here, or where are you? But uh, in any event, they have these different codas that they can use. So if you can crank that up a little bit. That's actually a blue whale call. So you can imagine sitting thousands of miles away 
you're another well, you want to make a long distance call. I don't know, there's not much you can say, you know, you're better off using Sprint, I guess. Here's another one. <laughs> And it turns out they actually have different codas that the uh, cetacean biologists have, rec have recognized. There's an A and a B and a C. And we know, for example, that they are, um, have actual certain punctuation to them. And then for the last one here, there's a little bit of other noise, but it'll come out in a second. That's a, actually a that's actually a frequency sweep of the animal in this really 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 low frequency regime. So we've talked about a uh, little bit about the physics of sound, uh, something about my own work in designing multi-beam high-frequency systems for looking at the behavior of zooplankton, and uh, we've talked a fair amount about other people in say the marine physical lab and its grips who are using active systems. And then the last sort of 15 or 20 minutes, we've given examples of use of passive systems. And I think that we all have to admit, and, and perhaps you've now got a better understanding, uh, certainly compared to optical imaging, sound is such a primitive mode. I mean, when you think of what you're seeing now and the resolution and the amount of information that you're getting, uh, we have nothing like that now in the ocean. And so we're all looking forward to perhaps these next generation sonar systems, which could be active or passive, which will be more like the images that, that you and I see today. So I want to thank you very much for coming here this morning. The question was, um, we have a transmitter in Kauai and a receiver in Monterey, but the distance between the, the core distance, these sounds actually propagate through um, almost what's called a sound channel. That is, the, uh, they refract and propagate through the ocean. It's almost like the way a lens focuses light. The temperature profile of the ocean actually can create channels for sound to focus. And unfortunately, I don't know if you're aware, there was a big well uh, uh, sort of uh, event where a number of these animals died uh, a few weeks ago in the uh, western part of the Caribbean. We think it was an extremely unfortunate uh, occurrence of a sound channel in concert with uh, a test of a, of a system which perhaps no one could have actually predicted that. So they, they travel kind of like that actually, almost like a waveguide is what we would call that. The question was, it's a good question, if we change frequency do we monitor the temperature at different depths? Um, I think that there are, they, they, they would try to use that to a certain extent, it's a good idea. And I think if you had a shorter path length, you could use that change in frequency a bit better. But because we're going so far, the frequency of the sounds is so low, and the amount of change in them, we don't have much opportunity for, for changing the frequencies. But that's an interesting concept, almost like a spectrometer for, for sound. Yeah. Right, the question was on our free fall system that I showed you before, and the gentleman uh, correctly inferred that the system would sink extremely slowly until it got to a prescribed uh, weight, at which time it would be, a prescribed depth, at, at which time it would drop a weight and then come back to the surface, hopefully. <laughs> or else I'm gonna be in big trouble. <laughs> it's, if you lose your you know, half million dollar instrument, it's hard to get another half a million dollars, so you're gonna see. I'm going to be walking around like, you know, so. How does sonar affect big schools of fish? Um, I guess the answer is, in truth, we don't really know. But I can tell you that people like Norwegians, whose livelihood depends on harvesting fish, have spent a lot of time developing acoustic techniques for doing that. and I. I don't believe that they've noticed any effect on the schools um, per se. Now, that being said, there are fish um, that are affected by our sonars, and it, it's an interesting thing. Those fish that are affected are fish that you might imagine would be predated upon by other animals that are using echolocation. So, for example, an animal that a porpoise or dolphin, the terciops, let's just use the correct term here, would hunt a small animal, 
Uh, some of those have actually developed the capability of hearing those frequencies. And that's only come out, say, in the last three or four years. So, because they're quite high, say 100 kilohertz or something like that. So I don't know of any effects on the structure of the schools, but uh, some of the animals actually do perceive the sound when you get, get into those frequency regimes. In our situation, we're using sound that's way, way above what we would expect the animals would be capable of hearing. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, in, in academia, you're sort of guilty to you prove yourself innocent, I guess, as opposed to outside. And there is a chance, of course, that, that we're interfering with it somehow.